why we have these so-called diet wars where one faction says, no, I, I went on the low fat, whole foods, vegan diet, and I reversed all these conditions. So that must be the right diet for humans. And then you have another crowd say, no, I went on a low plant food or a low carb diet or, and I reversed my, all my conditions. So that must be the right diet for humans. Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, our guest is Dr. Gil Cavallo. Gil is a physician, research scientist, science communicator, speaker, and writer. He initially trained as a medical doctor at the University of Lisbon in Portugal and later got his PhD in biology from Caltech or California Institute of Technology. He's published a number of peer-reviewed articles in the fields of genetics, molecular biology, nutrition behavior, aging, and neuroscience. In addition to his research career, he also has a passion for science communication. He directs and hosts his very own YouTube channel called Nutrition Made Simple, which aims to convey fundamental nutrition concepts to the general audience, trying to make it simple. In today's episode, we talked about everything you need to know about nutrition from an evidence-based perspective. We talked about how to interpret data and research on nutrition. What's better? plant-based, carnivore, or is it something else? Are seed oils and artificial sweeteners really bad for you? And how do you evaluate your cholesterol markers when you get your blood test back? What is the best blood test that everyone should be getting to evaluate their risk for cardiovascular disease? Is intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, or in particular, circadian fasting, better for you than eating whenever you feel like it? And lastly, he shares a hack on how you can reduce your blood pressure without completely eliminating salt from your diet. We hope you enjoy. Dr. Carvalho, welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to have you. Thanks for having me. So nutrition made simple. I really love that name because I think we tend to really overcomplicate things, and there's so much noise, right? There's fad diets, there's keto, there's carnivore, there's plant-based, and it's really hard to identify what is the evidence because, you know, as you probably can, you know, can appreciate this as someone in research as well, is that you can be convinced of anything, right? In academic medicine, we often do debates, right? Where you're like, this surgery is better than this surgery. And one person will very convincingly say, this is the best surgery, this is the only surgery you should do. And the other one will say the same thing. And basically the point is to say that there's no one right answer, but you can be convinced looking at data and, and saying this is the right thing. So what, you know, in terms of nutrition, like, is it really simple? It's not as simple as we'd like it to be. There is a level of complexity. Uh, there is heterogeneity in the data, and that's where a lot of this debates will come from. So in basically any question you ask in research, if you run an experiment enough times, especially in human beings, we tend to be very misbehaved, and we don't uh, shape our entire lives to conform to the, to the conveniences of a trial. There is variation. There is variability individual, inter-individually, inter, inter and also from trial to trial. Sometimes trials look at different populations. They look at different levels of intake. So all of this contributes to heterogeneity. But what we try to do, and this is a, a pillar of research, not just in nutrition in general, but certainly in nutrition, and what we try to convey to the public is this idea that we don't really base overarching ideas on individual studies, precisely because there's heterogeneity. So this concept of balance of evidence, looking at evidence systematically, on a given question, different studies doing looking at different populations, using complementary approaches. So your viewers may, may be familiar with some of these terms. There's studies called randomized trials. There's studies called observational studies or cohort studies. There's mechanistic studies. And we ideally look for concordance. We look for these different lines of evidence converging. And in general, you see a pattern of things going in the same direction, that's when our confidence is maximized. If we don't see that, then we try to make sense of what's going on. Um, but so that's kind of the, the bird's eye view. We try, to, we try to give an idea of the big picture. It's like, instead of looking at one pixel in a picture, stepping back and seeing what does the big picture look like? I think that's a really good way to look at things in general, right? And where is the burden of evidence the highest? 
But, you know, as you know, there are a lot of sort of fad diets or diets that have go in trends, right? Before it was the Atkins diet, then it was the South Beach diet. Now it's ketogenic diet and carnivore and raw vegan. And the thing is, people tend to get really emotional about these diets. So why do you think that is? Why do people get so charged up about when they learn these things and they feel sort of transformed and enlightened by them? I think one side of it is that food is literally a visceral topic. It contacts with our viscera directly. So it's something that's very, very emotional for us. It's part of our cultures. It's part of how we identify the food that our parents fed us. All of this is very, plays an important role in how people see themselves. On top of all that, we have the fact that a lot of people struggle with different conditions. Excess weight is a common one in our society. Then there's different intolerances, different allergies. And so oftentimes when people encounter these diets, they experience different, they have different stories. I came from a diet XYZ. Typically they come from the standard Western diet. Then they encounter one of these diets and they report different benefits. So these anecdotes are extremely powerful for people who experience them. And that's completely understandable. So oftentimes we have this clash between the anecdote and the balance of evidence. And often when we look at it, there's no contradiction, but at first sight, there, there may seem to be one. If I'm eating a lot of foods, that long-term the data points to some concerns, but for some reason, they help me lose weight, for example. We see this with all kinds of different diets. Even before these, um, these more modern trends, there were diets like the, the white rice diet back in the 60s. So these were trends where by giving people radical elimination diets, you're able to achieve weight loss. And with weight loss typically come a lot of benefits. Again, going back to this idea of stepping back and looking at the big picture, weight loss is great if you're losing excess fat mass. But we have to remember it's not everything. So we want to hold on to the gains, but we also want to keep our eye on the long term. Uh, optimization of health. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of times, one, when you're eliminating a lot of things from your diet, you may be eliminating allergens or other things that maybe your particular system doesn't tolerate well, and you haven't figured that out because you never did a true elimination diet. Or two, you start seeing t tremendous weight loss because some of these diets can be very satiating or very fulfilling. And you're then feeling great because you're losing weight and your body's, you know, not carrying around so much weight as it does its daily activity. So I think that's a really important point. And do you think that these diets come about in terms of, is it more because of the, the satiating properties or more because of the elimination properties? Like, where do you think the balance lies in terms of like, why are these so, so touted? A common theme is the weight loss and the consequences of weight loss. So would weight loss consistently we see improvements in glucose metabolism. So people, all the way to putting diabetes in remission or just improving insulin resistance, inflammatory markers tend to look better, lipids tend to look better, particularly triglycerides, but also cholesterol to some extent. People sometimes have pain in their, especially lower limbs. And even if the reason is not originally the weight, certainly the, the excess weight makes it worse. So when you lose some of that excess weight, the pain often is improved or goes away. So a lot of these things do are connected to, to weight loss. I do think there is also a component of intolerances. So there's a number of diseases, allergies and different things, celiac, all the way from gastroenterological diseases. Yeah, there's lots of different reasons that where different people may do well on different diets. And this also explains this heterogeneity, these, these different anecdotes, why we have these so-called diet wars where one faction says, no, I, I went on the low-fat, whole foods, vegan diet, and I reversed all these conditions, so that must be the right diet for humans. And then you have another crowd say, no, I went on a low plant food or a low-carb diet, or and I reversed my all my conditions, so that must be the right diet for humans. They both have a nugget of truth in that they obtain some benefits. The problem always with, with an anecdote is to zone in what is, you know, on what is the cause and the effect. So even if the, that entire dietary shift delivered these benefits, just from that anecdote alone, we can't tell 
if it was one of the foods that was removed, if it was the cal the caloric balance that was shifted, if it was one of the foods that was introduced, it's impossible from the anecdote alone without more information or more manipulation or, or a trial or something like that to distinguish. So I think this is why we see a lot of this, these clashes on social media. But as I said, when we put together all of the evidence that we have with these anecdotes, often there is no contradiction. It often does make sense that we have, for example, weight loss or somebody, for example, with IBS, this type of gastroenterological conditions where they can't tolerate certain foods. Dysbiosis is a common one. So imbalances in the gut microbiome that make it hard for people to tolerate certain foods. And then when they remove these foods from the diet, they feel an improvement. One comparison that I sometimes use, which is maybe a sim simplistic, but I think illustrates the point, is if I have an injured ankle and I go for a run, it's not going to feel good. I'm going to feel sore and the ankle's going to swell. And if I stop exercising, actually, I'm going to feel better. That doesn't mean that exercise is wrong for humans and all scientists are wrong and lie to me. It means that I have a, something that I, I, I do need to address before I go on a run. And the advice, somebody tells me, no, just go for a run and just bite the bullet. That is not the correct advice for me. So when we understand these, these, um, these contexts, we see that there is often no contradiction per se. And one last thing to point out is that there is also areas of uncertainty. We don't know everything. So research and nutrition is ongoing. And there are things that are being actively figured out as we speak. So I, I think it's good to acknowledge that and not pretend like we know everything. But oftentimes looking at the big picture does provide clarity and, and calm, I feel like. Yeah, I, I like that. So now that we've sort of set the stage, let's. you did mention there's some nuggets of truth in people who may be doing a more carnivore-based diet. And there may be a nugget of truth in people doing a plant-based diet. So maybe talk about the risks and benefits of those sort of two extremes is the way I would say, not that either of them are, as you mentioned, completely inaccurate or, or bad for any, any one person. Yeah. So both of those, uh, if, if, we, if by vegan, we, we specify as a whole food plant-based diet, because there's always different ways of doing this and uh, different ways of kind of gaming the system, which humans are very good at. But if, we, <laughs> if we're talking about in Right, so people people will probably write, but oh, but I'm eating vegan, but it's 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 candy and uh, soda all day and um, chips. <laughs> so if if we were actually talking, yeah, if we're actually talking about a whole food, vegetable exclusive diet, all diets that are exclusively whole foods, regardless of the composition, pretty much, are going to help with weight loss, especially when compared to the typical diet of the Western world, which is a diet where an abundance of foods are ultra processed. Currently, the average US person is getting 60% of their calories from ultra processed foods. So it's more than half. The majority of their calories are coming from quote unquote junk food. And this number keeps increasing almost by 1% uh, a year. So it's, it's going up incrementally to the point where a lot of people don't know what food looks like anymore, what real food looks like. So this is the the big big hurdle is moving people more towards a whole food diet. That's what all these dietary trends get right. They all agree that ultra processed foods in excess are not a good idea. They're all correct about that in general, directionally correct. And then we have considerations and caveats of each of these diets. So if you're on a plant exclusive diet, you have to mind things like B12. You don't have a source of B12. You have to supplement something or take a fortified food. Other Vitamins or nutrients can also be things that it's good to keep an eye on. Iodine sometimes, depending on whether there's a salt source or not. The salt is often iodized. Protein sources, depending again on the composition of the vegan diet. Sometimes people go on these completely raw vegan or macrobiotic diets or fruit-only diets. Those can make it hard to get enough protein. So including these sources of protein like legumes and uh, soy, soy products tends to help with that. On the, the side of the animal product abundant diet, the concerns are more at the level of one cardiovascular disease, because these, these diets will typically be higher in the more saturated fat, rich foods, and lower in unsaturated fats. That balance is one of the main levers 
or levels of atherogenic lipoproteins in the blood. So that's one concern is cardiovascular disease risk long-term if indeed those lipids are substantially increased. They're not increased in everyone, but depending on susceptibility. And then there's other things that have some evidence for them, but I would say a lower level of confidence compared to cardiovascular disease. Things like specific types of cancer, like colorectal cancer, there's evidence that uh, diets high in red meat specifically may increase the risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, there's areas of uncertainty there as well, because it's hard to do a randomized trial looking at cancer as an, as an endpoint. It takes decades. You can't really realistically do it. Uh, things like neurodegenerative disease, some suggestive evidence as well. Uh, so those would be kind of the bird's eye view of the concerns and the, the caveats that I would take if I was put in one of those buckets. So in terms of the saturated fat versus unsaturated fat, you know, now they, people are often having these sort of leaner red meats, which tend to have a little bit less saturated fats like bison and those sorts of things. So would those be considered still in that red meat category in terms of unhealthy versus, you know, healthier? Or are there certain preparations of red meat, let's say, that are, uh, are better for you in terms of that balance? So the first thing that I would touch on is that the balance of evidence doesn't really say, it's not as simple as red meat being unhealthy. I think sometimes we have this temptation to put things in a completely black and white box. And that is simpler, but it's not, it's not that simple when we look at the data. A, diet, a healthy dietary pattern can contain some red meat. At least that's what the balance of evidence suggests. There's a level that uh, mainly these observational studies suggest, which is roughly around 100 grams per day of intake of unprocessed red meat, where we start to see the signal of risk, particularly for cardiovascular disease, we start to see that pop up. Now, again, there are areas of uncertainty there, but this is kind of the, the consistent observation, and this is where a lot of the guidelines are based. So you, most guidelines will, will suggest something like uh, stay under 75 or stay under 100 in that ballpark due to these, to these data. So it's about the, the, the amount, the, the, how much, uh, and the, the complete dietary pattern. In terms of the, the saturated fat, the fat, the fat component, we don't have a lot of long-term data separating lean meats from, from fatty meats. We have some randomized trials that are shorter term looking at meats with different, um, different amounts of fat content. And they do suggest that leaner meats are kinder on these uh, lipid metrics these atherogenic lipoproteins, which are uh, widely accepted to be the, the causal factor for, or one of the main causal factors for cardiovascular disease risk. So based on the evidence that we have, yes, if I were to include some red meat in my diet, one, I would absolutely favor unprocessed red meats because the outcome data is much better for those. So we're talking about fresh meat. So a steak or pork, as opposed to bacon or beef jerky or salami or these processed red meats. So that's the first distinction. Within unprocessed, yes, I would, I would favor leaner cuts. And then I would also favor white meats over red meats in general, just because the, the data is better for those. But I haven't seen any compelling data that having a steak once in a while, maybe once or twice a week, up to that level, meaningfully raise, raises risk. If it comes in the future, I'm open to it. But right now, that's that's basically what we have. Are you sick of going to the doctor only to have them talk at you for 15 minutes and leave without knowing exactly why they're prescribing you this certain medication and what exactly the next step is to take to optimize your health? Wouldn't it be great to finally find a doctor who actually listens to you, answers your questions, and doesn't rush you out the door? Well, at my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to do just that. I specialize in taking care of patients who have issues with their sex lives, issues with their bladder, with their hormone health, or are having pain in their pelvic region or with sex. My goal is to give you the time and attention you deserve so you can leave with a clear understanding of your condition as well as our treatment plan that's optimized for your goals. 
During your visit, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. And after you leave, you can reach me. It is super easy to send me a message through our secure portal and I'll get back to you within 24 to 48 hours. No questions asked, no hidden fees. Scheduling is easy easy. Just visit our website, renamalikmd.com slash appointments. We see patients in both Irvine and Beverly Hills, California, and I see patients virtually in California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. Oh, and don't forget Texas. If you're outside these states, consider seeing me for an educational visit. I look forward to seeing you. Okay, let's let's chat about cholesterol, because I think cholesterol has gotten a bad rap over the course of even my training, right? And, and being going into more recent years. So let's kind of break it down. What is cholesterol? When is it bad to have high cholesterol? And what should people be looking out for? So cholesterol is a lipid that we have throughout our body. It's, essential, it's an essential molecule in our body. It's not an essential nutrient because our body produces it. In fact, it's so important for our physiological function that our body produces plenty of it. Um, every cell throughout your body, from the tip of the finger to the tip of the nose, is producing cholesterol inside of it. So cholesterol uh, plays a, a key role in maintaining mem- membrane structure. So the, the membrane around cells, it can only maintain its appropriate structure. It has cholesterol in it. It plays different roles as well in hormone uh, synthesis. So different different roles throughout the body. So I think this is a very important distinction is to understand that cholesterol is an important molecule. We don't want it. We need it. If we don't have cholesterol in our body, we're not alive. That does not mean that we want to have it sky high in the blood. So it's similar really to many other metrics. Glucose, we have it throughout our body. No uh, human being has, has no glucose in their body. It's, it's an essential molecule. But we don't want it sky high in the blood. That's called diabetes. Uh, many other molecules are like that. Potassium, sodium. Lots of things. When the level in the blood is too high, uh, it can be a red flag. It can be a, a harbinger of problems. So specifically with regard to blood levels, the cholesterol level, one thing that is a bit, a bit uh, more intricate and can be confusing at first, but when we understand it, it kind of makes sense. The level of cholesterol in the blood, which is what we measure typically in a lipid panel, is a reflection of what causes risk. It's not itself the cause of risk. And in fact, it's possible to have cholesterol level a bit above normal and not be at high risk and vice versa. It's possible to have it a bit below the normal threshold and be at higher risk. The reason is that these fats, cholesterol and triglycerides are carried around in the blood in these little uh, vehicles, these little submarines called lipoproteins. So we've all heard about LDL and HDL. Those are types of lipoproteins. And some of those lipoproteins are what we call atherogenic. They cause disease. They lodge themselves into the artery wall and they cause plaque growth. And so this family of lipoproteins that causes disease is called the ApoB carrying lipoproteins. And so when we measure our LDL cholesterol, which people refer to as the LDL, but really is the LDL cholesterol. So what we're measuring is the content, is the cholesterol contained in the LDL lipoproteins. And this is a reflection of the number of these lipoproteins traveling around. And LDL lipoproteins are a subset of these ApoB, so they're a member of this family. So it's really uh, a red flag. It's like the the check engine light. You see the engine, the the light come on, check the engine. There might be something wrong there. Not 100% of the time, but there might be something wrong there. And the something wrong would be when you dig deeper, is your ApoB metric actually elevated? Another thing we can uh, introduce to people, this uh, other metric, which is more actually easier and people already have it, even though most people haven't heard of it, which is the non-HDL cholesterol. Not to get too into the weeds, but uh, it's, it's really simple. In your basic lipid panel, you take your total cholesterol, you subtract your HDL cholesterol, you have your non-HDL cholesterol. And that is similar to LDL cholesterol. It's a reflection of your total amount of these ApoB lipoproteins but it tracks risk better than LDL cholesterol. So in some people, there's what we call discordance. One might seem fine, but the other is high. And the H, when that's the case, HDL cholesterol, or sorry, non-HDL cholesterol 
not to be confused with HDL cholesterol, wins over LDL cholesterol. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Let me know if that. Uh, no, I think I think it makes sense. Are there other markers? So standard lipid lipid panels, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, and cholesterol, right? So should people be also mm -hmm. measuring those carriers, the apolipoprotein carriers, A and B? Uh, is that a better score? Are there other indicators that people should be looking at to get a better idea? Is something that correlates better with risk than ju just this check engine light? Uh, ApoB is the best metric of lipoproteins. Of uh, lipoprotein related risk, so it's a it's a lab test, just like LDL cholesterol or triglycerides. You can get your ApoB measured. That's currently most of the evidence points to that being the best, better even than that that non HDL cholesterol that I mentioned. Non HDL cholesterol is is fairly close. A number of these other things are they correlate with disease, especially in population settings in population studies. So the level of triglycerides. If it's frankly high, it's not, a, it's not, I definitely, I would investigate and look at what might be going on. There's numerous causes. Excess fat mass is one common cause. Uh, diabetes, lots of things that tend to increase triglycerides. So these are also red flags. ApoB is the, is the one that's been shown to be causal uh, in more compelling experiments. So that's why we focus on that. And then in, for, for cardiovascular risk, things that are not included in the lipid panel, Glucose level absolutely is a causal risk factor. Blood pressure is a causal risk factor. Smoking, obviously, you know, physical activity. These, this uh, constellation of, of key risk factors are all absolutely relevant. So in terms of reducing your risk of apolipoprotein B or non-HDL cholesterol, which seem to be the most indicative of potential risk, what foods should we be avoiding? So typically, you want to favor unsaturated fats over saturated fats. More olive oil. Think olive oil instead of butter, for example, right? Or lean meats instead of fatty meats or fat, uh, fatty fish. Fish is a weird animal product because although it's an animal product, even the, the fatty cuts have a lot of unsaturated fats. These EPAs, DHAs, uh, these polyunsaturated fats are very rich in fish. And so... Fish is a kind of an exception where if you, even if you're eating the fatty kind, uh, it's much more benign on the lipids than uh, fatty red meat, for example. So you want to favor fish and seafood, walnuts, nuts and seeds, vegetable oils like olive oil. Other vegetable oils, oils have a similar role, canola oils and things like that. Even though on the internet, they have this terrible reputation and people start pulling their hair out when we mention uh, seed oils or canola oil. The truth is when we go over the the scientific evidence, and I've done this a couple of times for canola, for example, overwhelming balance of evidence towards benefit. I was actually pretty surprised uh, at the amount of evidence and the consistency. So, but if you're worried about canola or another seed oil because you heard so much stuff on the internet, just go for olive, olive oil. Can't go wrong with that. Or some people prefer the whole food forms of fats, the olives themselves, or the nuts and seeds in general, walnuts, almonds. That's one big factor. Soy protein has a, a cholesterol ApoB lowering effect as well. In general, if you think that traditional Mediterranean diet pattern, it will include most of these factors that are known to lower ApoB. So the unsaturated, the predominance of unsaturated fats, obviously olive oil is a staple of the traditional Mediterranean diet. The fatty fish, the seafood, lower in saturated fats, and then soy may or may not be included in a med traditional Mediterranean diet, but it's another thing that can help. Another thing are phytosterols, which are present in some foods like nuts, for example, and those can have an effect in the intestine of blunting cholesterol absorption a little bit. That can help in some people. Traditional Mediterranean diet is an easy way to kind of check all the right boxes and, and get in the right zone. Let's talk about the seed oil stuff, because I think you're right. People are really intensely, I mean, I see it on TikTok everywhere. Stop eating seed oils. Like it's like a life hack right now. So why, why did this come up? Like what was the, the study or the investigation that sparked this concern about seed oils? And what does the evidence like point to in terms of health benefits or risks? So there's a couple of things that people normally point to. Some of it is research in, in animals, for example, lab animals like rodents. And that has to do with the fact that it's 
fed to these animals in a very large amount, and also the fact that these animals are physiologically different from, from us. So there's a, a number of differences there. Then there's things that aren't, they're not scientific evidence in the true sense of the word, but people point to these correlations, these ecological associations. So people say, well, seed oil, oil consumption went up around the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, and obesity went up as well. And lots of things happen concurrently when we look at historical patterns, but we don't assume cause and effect. We have to test that in proper scientific experiments. There's lots of things that coincided. Use of computers also went up, you know, driving went up, which we're not going to assume that that's the cause of uh, more heart attacks. There's these associations, these ecological association type data. There's data in, in, cell, in, uh, in animal models. There's also some, a couple of trials from the 60s, randomized trials, that had some confounders, things like trans fats, which at the time were not understood. And so when we look at those trials at face value, it may seem like the saturated fat is looking better than the group that was supposedly fed these unsaturated fats, these seed oils. The problem is that we now understand that there was a, a trans fat compounder there. And trans fats are actually, if anything, a little worse than saturated fat for cardiovascular disease. And when we put all of the trials together, even the trials from the 60s, from the same era, we see a preponderance of evidence pointing to favoring these unsaturated fats over saturated fats. So a lot of the information on online is, is coming from selectively looking at one or, one or two of these trials that seem to be in the opposite direction, that are, seem to be outliers, and focusing exclusively on those. So not doing that step of looking back at the, the full picture. When I looked at this in a couple of videos, so we have one looking at inflammation, which is a common question. We have one looking at cardiovascular disease. And by the way, I, when I went into this, I had no preference or no preconceived notion Traditionally, I don't uh, include a lot of seed oils in my diet just because I grew up in, in Europe and in Portugal, and we mo mostly use olive oil. So I didn't, I wasn't afraid of them, or, but I wasn't in love with them either. Whatever the evidence says, I, I'm happy to report that. But the balance of evidence was so consistent against most of these ideas that are propagated on the internet and that spread that like wildfire. That's been the gist of, of these videos that we did. And yeah, it's it's been very interesting. The response has been very polarized from viewers, uh, both people who welcome it and who say, finally, you know, where was all this data? And thanks for putting some science to this. It's all this yelling and hair pulling. Also, people very some people very upset uh, that we are suggesting that these ideas may not be factual. But yeah, I think it's it's an interesting set of ideas, set of set of beliefs. The other thing to say also is that. And this probably has a lot to do with it. The way that most seed oils are being consumed by Western societies, and in the U.S. particularly, is not coming from uh, foods that are health-promoting. So it's absolutely true, simplistically, that if we tell the typical Westerner and the typical American or the typical U.S. person to cut the seed oils, and they cut the foods that they typically eat that contain seed oils, they will be cutting foods that are not health promoting and they will experience a lot of benefits. This does not mean that it was the seed oil among the thousand ingredients that caused these changes because the foods that most people in the West consume containing seed oils are these ultra processed foods where seed oils are, are, are routinely used. But when we look at research uh, testing the actual effect of just giving seed oil, give, give canola oil, to a group of people, watch the effects, watch the level of lipids, watch the glucose metabolism, watch the risk of cardiovascular disease. That is dramatically different. So what the evidence is pointing to is that the consumption of the oils themselves do not seem to be a major cause of concern. If anything, they are beneficial compared to some other alternatives like very uh, saturated fat concentrated foods. A couple of valid caveats, I think, are we talked about the source, and another one would be if they are blasted for, for days on end, sometimes I think the, the utilization of these oils in a Burger King or a place like that uh, is, is by repeatedly frying them. So fry and let them cool down and fry again the same batch over and over and over again for a week. Yeah, I'm completely open to the possibility that there you are creating problems and that it's not going to be the best product when you sub subject it to that type of treatment. But 
that would be the case for almost anything. If you deep fry it for a week, you deep fry cucumbers for a week is probably not going to be the best, the healthiest food. So I, I think it's the the logical leaps, right? And the 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 the, the temptation to extrapolate, I think, is where we have to be careful. Yeah, there's actually some recent data that said olive oil is health promoting or health beneficial. Did you, uh, it was sort of a big article. I didn't get into the weeds with it, but maybe you could touch on that a little bit. The data that we have on olive oil is, we were talking about the different prongs of evidence, right? The randomized trials and the, uh, the observational research. And briefly, we see that in populations that consume more olive oil, they tend to have better health outcomes, particularly cardiovascular disease, than other sources like butter, for example. There you always have these additional questions. Okay, is it because they're eating more vegetables? Is it is it because they eat healthier diet in general? You always have these additional questions. There are tools in observational research to try to address that and try to minimize that. But you also want to look at randomized trials. And with olive oil, we have quite a few. There's both short-term trials just using olive oil itself and just with, as the only variable. And then we have the luxury of having these long-term, large-scale trials looking at dietary patterns that include olive oil. So obviously there, we can't say that the effects are specifically due to olive oil, as we were saying before. Uh, but we have three large trials. And when I say large, hundreds to thousands of subjects over several years, five to seven years of follow-up, looking at Mediterranean diets, where the main sources of added fat are olive oil. Uh, in one of them, in the Lyon, they used olive and canola as a, both, but the other trials tend to focus on olive oil, um, Redimed and Cordiopref. And briefly, we see an improvement in cardiovascular outcomes. Outcomes, we, we're talking about actual cardiovascular events. So uh, rate of heart attacks or revascularization or strokes, things like that. In all three of these large trials, we see an improvement. Uh, and they have, some of them look at uh, people who are in primary prevention, so they haven't had a heart attack. Some look at secondary prevention where they have already had an event and they were trying to prevent another event. So again, this benefit of looking at different populations, uh, looking for this concordant, concordance of effect. As we were saying before, there are areas of uncertainty. It's not that the certainty is absolute that olive oil is you know, a perfect food or a superfood. I don't even I don't even like the term superfood because I, I think it's more of a marketing term than anything else. But it's true that we have enormous concordance, enormous consistency, where whether it's observational, short-term randomized, long-term ra randomized looking patterns, we can consistently see benefit of olive oil over certain other sources of fat. So this is why it's generally recommended. And, and just to, to, to tie it to the previous topic. In some studies that compare olive oil to some seed oils, like canola, for example, we don't see a big difference uh, in either direction. Some trials show a bit of an advantage of one, some others a bit of the other. But overall, they seem about comparable from the evidence that we have, with canola specifically, where we have more, more data. I think with olive oil, uh, it, it's more popular and more encouraged uh, the consumption than canola, canola for example because we have more data on it, more trials on olive oil and on Mediterranean diets using olive oil. So I'd say that the level of confidence is probably a bit higher. Quick break from this episode to let you know, I am so grateful that you're spending part of your day with me. I started creating content online to empower people to learn more about their bodies without needing to go see a doctor, pay a copay, wait in a waiting room, or find parking. And it has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. If you want to help support our mission of providing free education, please consider joining our premium membership. There you will have access to ad-free episodes, which are released early, as well as free transcripts and the opportunity to ask me anything. And these questions are answered in our monthly AMA episodes. Support the show and join today at renamalik.supercast.com. Can't wait to see you there. So I want to shift gears a little bit to plants. There's sort of like a war on plants so with some creators and some individuals saying plants have toxic chemicals, they they you know, have all these metabolites or oxalates and they're dangerous. And so I want to touch on why are they claiming this and what are the harms of not eating 
vegetables, right? If you follow these individuals and you don't eat any vegetables, what are the harms? The first thing to say, uh, and this is, I, I think, a general good mindset. When you hear somebody talk about an individual component of a food, we call this a mechanistic argument. So somebody saying food X is poison or good. It could be good or bad, the argument, because of, a, of this one molecule that it contains. That's a hypothesis. It's a possibility. It's a question that we ask. But what we do with the hypothesis is we test it. And we run a trial or we look at cohort studies and we ask human beings eating this food, not the isolated component, purified at, you know, 50-fold the amount given to a rat, but human beings eating the, the actual food, are they better off or worse off? That's the, the key litmus test. Uh, so that's a general approach to the to the the general argument of the, the bad molecule, which is very common from all dietary camps. So with this, it's, it's very straightforward. When we look at evidence on the consumption of plants in general, overwhelming balance of evidence towards benefit, whether it's randomized trials, whether it's cohort studies, looking at metrics, looking at outcomes, looking at cardiovascular risk, looking at cancer risk, looking at neurodegenerative disease risk. Uh, so that is why consistently you see in guidelines all over the world this recommendation to include unprocessed fruits and vegetables in your diet. That's where it's coming from. Now, this doesn't mean that some people can't have intolerances. Some people are allergic to peanuts. That doesn't mean that peanuts are bad for human beings. It means that we're not all the same. So there are people, I've had people in my own family who had these intolerances. So I'm completely you know, I, I don't resist this idea at all that some people have intolerances, gastrointestinal, dermatological, allergies, and they don't do well on these on, on some plant foods, sometimes on many plant foods. And they experience relief, they experience improvements when some or all of these foods are removed. I think that's, that's people who have reported, I have viewers who are in this position, and I, I believe them completely. What I would suggest, and this is what I tried to do in my family when we, we were in this position, is number one, trying to identify the root cause. I think people finding relief in these elimination diets in and of itself is, is good. People sometimes come from years of suffering and they find relief. I think that's great. Uh, it's good news. Um, I would be wary of then going to fairy tale to embellish or to remove any caveats, telling people that, oh no, no, actually, you're experiencing these benefits because these foods are poison for humans and everybody else is wrong. Everybody who feels great on these foods and all these trials, it's all wrong. Your experience is the only thing that's right. I don't think that's a very empowering message. You're taking away the understanding from that person. It might be emotionally, you know, it gives you some, some reassurance in the moment because you've come from this history of suffering and you found this thing that gives you relief, and yet your doctor sometimes is telling you, don't do it. So you're torn, and then somebody on the internet tells you, no, actually, you're the one who's right. Everybody else is wrong. Of course, this is a, something that's welcomed. So figuring out what the root cause is, is it an allergy? Is, a, is it an intolerance to a specific food? Maybe you can remove that one food and still put together a diet that is health-promoting in the long run and still get the benefits of that elimination. So you can get, um, you know, you can keep, get, eat your cake and, get, and have it too. Best of both worlds. That's one caveat, trying to get to the root cause and being careful with these feel-good messages that oftentimes are not based on scientific evidence. The other thing that I would point out is if you are in a, in a position where the elimination diet is all you have and you have to stay there because you've exhausted alternatives, accepting that every diet has caveats. So. If you have eliminated a large number of foods, if there are concerns there, if it's your cardiovascular markers went up, try to address those. Like stay on that diet if you have to, but address the caveats, um, you know, uh, so that you still get the benefits, you still get the, the short-term improvements in how you feel, but you are ensuring yourself in the long run as well. So should people on these sort of restrictive diets, should they be testing their micronutrients? like? You know, there's a lot of sort of micronutrient panels that you can get online or from your doctor can write for them. Um, are, are those of value? Depends on the diet. Uh, 
So for example, if you're on a completely vegan diet and you don't have a, B, a source of B12, yeah, sooner or later, you're going to have a situation where you're going to be deficient. So measuring B12 is something that makes sense, but absolutely try to have B12 in your, in your, uh, have, have a strat a dietary strategy that includes a, a good source of B12. But that's one, one specific case. If you suspect that something is missing, that is an essential nutrient. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Sometimes um, vitamin D, depending people who eliminate a lot of dairy from their diet, for example, measuring vitamin D levels can, can be informative. I think it's more of a, um, if you have a nutrient of concern, if for some reason your diet is not, you're not getting from your diet a nutrient or you suspect you're not getting, or if you have a symptom that could be related to some nutrient deficiency, I think measuring it makes sense and considering supplementation makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that's where you get the, the most bang for your buck in terms of measuring. Okay. So we've talked a lot about what we're putting into our, bo our bodies in terms of diet, but what about intermittent fasting? What is the evidence in terms of fasting? Are there true benefits or is it more the calorie restriction from time-restricted eating? The balance of notice is telling us that it's mostly the calories. Now, that does not mean that the benefits aren't real. They're very real and they're very, uh, they can be very impressive. Some people have, you know, revolutionary results by fasting because of the weight loss and, and all these downstream benefits. Uh, and sometimes by, by fasting, people also remove some of the worst foods that they were eating. So a lot of the snacks and all of these, a lot of these foods that they would binge sometimes late at night or something like that, those are the ones that are removed instead of the main meals. And so uh, that also contributes. So I don't think there's a contradiction. I think the benefits are absolutely real. I think fasting is a very valid approach that works really well for some people, works incredibly well for some people. Now, I wouldn't tell everyone that they have to go fast Otherwise, they're hurting themselves. I think that, that logical leap is where I think influencers go too far. The results that we have don't point to any benefit of fasting that is independent from calories. There's, there are questions around the time of eating, the, the chronobiology. That's a related but separate question. But fasting itself, just a block of time without eating, we don't have anything compelling that indicates that there's anything kind of magical or anything uh, specific about fasting that's delivering that you can't get elsewhere. Even this idea of autophagy, which is very popular in the fasting community, you can get autophagy, you can activate autophagy by cutting calories as well. So caloric restriction or fasting, if equated for calories, you get autophagy in both. So, and the fact that we basically in these trials, when they match for calories, people fasting and people not fasting, you see similar changes. Uh, so this is telling us that it is probably through, via, via the calories, but I wouldn't, that to me doesn't minimize the results that people get. By hook or by crook, the results are real and great. So for the people who do well on fasting, who like to integrate fasting, uh, I, I often say it's out of the fads or out of the trends. It's my favorite one because it doesn't involve doing anything super dangerous or eating something crazy or, you know, it's just, we're telling uh, Westerners to eat a little bit less. and. Uh, if you tell them to count calories or to eat less and move more, you're pilloried. But if you tell them to intermittently fast and do uh, high intensity interval training, you're a genius. So, hey, whatever gets the result. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said there's a the chronobiology. So is there value to circadian fasting or follow your, following your circadian rhythm? So there, there is a bit of um, heterogeneity in the data. There are some trials that suggests that eating the same meals earlier in the day is a bit better metabolically. So really interesting studies, um, looking at the same exact foods, but just shifted earlier versus shifted later. And they've even matched the fasting. So everybody's fasting the same, the same amount of time. So everybody's eating, let's say, in an eight-hour window, for example, or 10-hour window. But that window gets shifted earlier in the day versus later in the day. And there are a few trials that show that there are there seem to be some benefits, maybe in terms of weight loss, in terms of insulin resistance, glucose metabolism style uh, type metrics to eating earlier in the day. And there is some circadian data supporting this. We tend to be a bit more insulin resistant late at night. 
Uh, so there might be something going on there. I should also say that there are trials that don't recapitulate this, but there are possible reasons. Sometimes the window is not as short as it could be. So people argue, okay, maybe they didn't just, they didn't just crunch the window long uh, enough. So there are possible methodological reasons why it's not seen. I'm open to the possibility that eating foods earlier in the day is a bit better. I think what should be said is that, and this I think is is agreed upon uh, pretty much universally, is that if there is an effect of this circadian uh, circadianicity of eating earlier in the day, it is a much smaller effect than calories overall. So, yeah, if you're gonna if you want to do this, I see no problem. But bear in mind that the that still the, the the overall caloric balance is going to be the main lever for uh, weight maintenance and glucose metabolism and food quality. That's another caveat. I think sometimes people get hung up on on the fasting and these these new trends, and they forget the old things that we know. And oh, as long as I'm fasting, then I'm going to eat this feast after. Sometimes people say the problem is not the fasting; it's the feasting. So it's as people people fast for a number of hours, right? And then they feel like, okay, I work really hard. Now I can reward myself. And they go and eat a really unhealthy meal. Not everybody does this, but it's it's a, a caveat. Um, if you're eating unhealthy foods, probably you're undoing all the, the any benefit that you got from the fasting. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. But I do think that some people do experience better sleep when they eat earlier because their body can, you know, not be busy digesting their food. And so I think that may play a role in some of that chronicity as well. Um, and then we know that overall sleep will boost testosterone, increased, increased testosterone allows you to get more muscle mass. And so maybe there is something there. But again, I think you're, you make a good point that if you're eating bad during your fasting window, even if it's or your feasting window, even if it's earlier in the day, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you're, you're kind of, uh, undoing the the good. I, I have no problem with that. If just if, if people feel better for whatever reason, eating earlier in the day as a night owl, uh, I don't I don't experience. I can't say that I experience that, uh, but I completely believe, and I, I don't see a problem if people want to sh shift their their meals earlier in the day. If anything, it has um, evidence to support it. You know, I think in in medical school, right, in our training, at least in the West. We learn very little about nutrition. And I've, I've gone on record. I've said this. I wish we knew more about nutrition because that's prevention, right? Nutrition is one of the pillars of health that we should be spending our time counseling patients on and helping them guide this, this issue. And because we're so very, I mean, I, I say all the time, the Mediterranean diet is the most studied because that's accurate, right? So most say it has, the, as it has an abundance of, of data. But when someone comes to me and says, hey, I'm doing the carnivore diet, it's great, or I'm doing a, a raw foods vegan diet, it's great. You know, I can only tell them what I know, which is minimal, right? Like I, I can't know everything about every single diet. But why do you think that we haven't adapted our training in medicine to really emphasize nutrition more? I think it's, it's, it's a failure of the medical system, but also society widely have this problem. I think we should be learning about nutrition, about the fundamentals from elementary school. It's so crucial. The fact that the fact that even professionals of health don't learn about it. And I completely agree with you. When I went to medical school, I learned precious little. There was maybe one class uh, in like third year uh, where we learned a little bit, learned about what nutrients are, essential nutrients, vitamins. But it's so rudimentary. To me, it's 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 crazy that a we're not teaching everyone about this thing that everyone does and is so fundamental for health and so many of the main causes of death of our society are critically uh, influenced by what we eat. Massive failure, I think, of education in general and then specifically for, for people who specialize in, in medicine and in, uh, in health to not have that training is crazy. Uh, now, what sometimes will happen and you may, I don't know if you have this experience, is Doctors will work with registered dietitians, so they'll refer um, patients to a, an RD for more specialized uh, uh, nutrition advice. 
So I think that can work. It's kind of a compartmentalization of, of the advice or the competences. But yeah, so I don't think it's realistic for every doctor to be a specialist in depth of nutrition, but I think having a, a strong foundation would be critical. And even starting much earlier, I was reading this article about the education in Japan. And it's a key part of Japanese education starting in elementary school. So the kids eat together, they they present foods to classmates and they talk about nutrition at the age of like six or seven. So it starts young. And so here we have almost the opposite where the foods that are served in schools are the worst kind and the foods that are served sometimes in hospitals are the worst kind. So we really don't have an institutional support for for something that a student should be so essential. And then of course, we pay the tab later on in terms of diseases and uh, and early death. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess everybody agrees with this, but how do we change the system is is the the, the tricky part. I, I think part of it is is giving medical students this 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 information. I have a number of viewers who are medical students or you know researchers of other fields. But yeah, I think until we have and we we've, we've given some lectures actually to medical schools and nursing schools, kind of touching on some of these topics. So I, I'm always really excited when I get an invitation to do something like that, which happens occasionally, but not as much as it, as it should. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, let's get this YouTuber to give a one hour thing. It should be, here's this uh, curriculum of nutrition over the four years of medical school, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly how we, how we change the system, but I think it's, if we don't, we're in dire straits. Yeah, and I think part of it is, you know, if you go to your doctor and ask them about nutrition, you may get a paltry response because depending on the doctor and their, you know, historical experience in the nutrition space and how much self-learning they do. As you mentioned, even you learned so much from studying seed oils, for example. But like I learn every day when I'm creating content and reading and reading research and you know, trying to find things out for my patients. And I think that like, there's some doctors who don't do that, don't have time for that, have very busy practices or seeing 50 patients a day, whatever it is. And so they know what they know and they don't have time to delve into these topics in detail. And so they may not have a great answer for you. That doesn't mean that I think in general, they're not, you know, they're going to tell you the basics, right? Which is maybe move more, eat less or calories in, calories out. Or, and that may be frustrating when you're seeing all these things on social media saying, it's not just that, but is it, is it just that? Do you think it's just calories in, calories out? Is that a reasonable response? I think it's a very incomplete response and it's not particularly actionable for most people. That's why we have this clash. It's not that it's incorrect. It's that it doesn't tell people what to do. It's like telling people, oh, you're poor, make more money. <laughs> it's, not, it's not actionable, it doesn't help me. Um, calories in, calories out is basically, it's explaining the mechanism, but how do people get there? You have to give people tools to implement in real life. That's where, that's where this type of advice is not good. And that's where things like, oh, fast, stop eating at 4 p.m. And cut all the carbs from your diet. Cut all the fat from your diet. These things uh, sometimes are overhyped. Some of them are not particularly based on strong evidence in terms of saying that all carbohydrate is bad or all fat is bad. But what they are is very actionable and very effective, at least for some people. And very simple. You, tell, you explain that in five seconds. Here's what you do. Everything with carbohydrate now is poison. Eliminate that from your diet. You eliminate most foods that you're eating on a typical Western diet. It's a radical elimination diet. You lose weight. Same with low fat. Same with uh, all of these different things. The, the Twinkie diet, all these things where you're only supposed to eat one thing. Sooner or later, you're fed up with that thing. You're, 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 uh, you know, you're nauseated and you stop eating. You're not eating 3,000 calories and you're, you lose weight. What we need to do, and this is the challenge that I, I think it's, 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 it behooves us who, you know, we're, we're taking on the challenge, you and me and so many others, where we're trying to bridge scientific knowledge with the public. And it's, it's not easy, um, but it's, it's, I think, our task to come up with something that is evidence-based and empowering and uh, actionable, that gives people the results short-term, but also supports their, their long-term health, that we don't shortchange them uh, for kind of a popular crash diet. Not easy. I'm not 
pretending to have uh, the magic recipe, but that's essentially what I try to do with my content. And, and you know, I, it's changing over the years as I get feedback, as I learn more from viewers also. And, and it's, it's kind of this, this dance, right? Um, I, I'm, I'd love to hear also your, your experience uh, with you have a much larger platform than I do. So maybe you have other insights that I haven't even gotten to. Yeah, you know, I think you have to meet people where they are. And I think people are all over the place in terms of um, what they're ready to change about their life. And you're right. I think sometimes getting on a diet that you enjoy, right? Like say you really like meat and you're like, oh, the carnivore diet is great. It gives me all the things I like and I get to lose weight. And, you know, and, and like, you could be like, okay, how can we make this healthier, right? How can we make this version of your diet healthier? Um, how can, what are the things that you eat and, you know, taking it like sort of in an atomic habits sort of way, take one small change at a time and incrementally do that till you get to a diet that is sustainable, long lasting, and that you can actually, you know, maintain for years on end. I think that's sort of the challenge with some of these diets is, yeah, you can do them for two years, maybe uh, three years even. But at some point you're like, you know what, I just want to eat piece of pizza or I just want to eat a piece of bread and like I can't do it anymore right so I think it's sort of meeting people where they are and making these incremental changes that are very individualized because as you mentioned people are very individualized and they may have sensitivities and they may have issues and they may have poor sleep and they may have other things that you have to take into consideration and that's where you know, the stuff we do is great. We give general information to people, but it's not applicable to every single individual. I mean, the, the, the overall sort of pillars of information are applicable, but there's individual nuance that we can't get on when we're talking on social media. Completely agree with that. That's something that, I, especially with nutrition, where there's so much variation, I'll make a video going over a topic and invariably I'll get people saying, well, but I experienced something different. And someone else will be on the other end of the spectrum. So that's been a, a learning experience for me, trying to make content that communicates the pillars of the evidence, but at the same time, kind of trying to help people, trying to individualize a little bit, although it's so limited because you, if you're talking to however many thousands of people, you can't personalize at any meaningful level. So you're always kind of generalizing a bit. Um, but what we said about uh, sustainability long term is so crucial, and this is a, a common pattern that we see with these trials, with all of these diets, by the way, the low fat, the low carb, the vegan, all of these interventions, after a certain period, from six months to a year, around there, people just start falling off the wagon like crazy uh, with all of these diets, even when they get really impressive results initially. Even with the results, it's not enough for most people to stick to these diets. This is something that has really stuck with me from, from looking at these trials, whether it's, uh, you know, and even things that aren't randomized, where it's targeted to help people with a specific dietary pattern and all the investigators are motivated and believe in that diet. And you still see long-term over two years, three years, terrible sustainability as a whole. And then there's always the 5% or 10% or whatever percentage of people that do stick with the diet and love it. And those, I think, become the evangelizers on social media uh, that are very angry that they're not being listened to because, hey, it works so well for me. How, how come isn't everybody isn't doing the same thing? And again, there's a nugget of truth there that it did work for them and they were able to stick with it. But unfortunately, this change of habit with food specifically, it's so difficult for most people to to sustain. So there, I think, is, is another challenge is get, how to get people to stick to these to these changes. That's where another somewhat, you could argue it's an advantage of a Mediterranean style pattern, met, traditional Mediterranean, because it's a bit closer to what people are used to. It's a mix of foods and it's not super low fat or super low carb. You're not completely eliminating any food groups. So perhaps a little easier for the average person to to attain to that uh, in the long run than these more extreme varieties. 
So earlier we had Jordan Side on the podcast, who's a, a physical uh, fitness trainer. And he said, you know, in order to maintain or improve, depending on what you decide your plan is for that time. So if you're trying to maintain your weight or lose weight, you need to be consistent for 80% of the time. That means 24 to 25 days out of the month, right? So if you're good for the whole week and then every weekend for two days, you eat like crap, you're not going to, you're going to eat, right? So I thought that was really great advice because it gives you like this sense of like, okay, I can be, I can enjoy four or five days and probably not hurt my progress. But more than that, I'm going to start seeing issues. What I want to finish up with is like, what are the things that like the, the pillars you tell people that are the most important things for diet? Whole foods, probably number one, and everybody will agree with that. So a diet predominantly made up of whole foods. Again, we don't need to be, we don't need to exaggerate and be obsessive. Oh, there's one thing. I mean, olive oil is not a whole food. Um, you know, I'm not against eating something you know, uh, less optimal once in a while, but the dietary pattern in general is predominantly composed of whole foods. Balance of evidence for most people without intolerances. Yes, a diet with unprocessed plant foods, with fiber containing foods, uh, where those are present in a substantial amount is going to be beneficial. In general, so we're talking fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains. The fats predominantly, again, these vegetable source fats, the olive oil, uh, the nuts and seeds, uh, the fatty fish with seafood, that's also a, a good component to include. In terms of dairy and meats, fermented sources of dairy have better outcomes. So yogurt probably has the best. Uh, there's something about the fermentation there that seems to, to make the food uh, healthier, maybe it's maybe it's the presence of uh, microorganisms, to, uh, probiotics per se, uh, or it's something else that process uh, changes the properties. In terms of meats, I would favor again fish and lean uh, lean meats, white meats, red meat more sparingly, maybe a couple of times a week uh, for people who want to include it. Low to no al alcohol. The evidence in indicates that it's approximately a straight line. This idea that we used to have that drinking a little bit is better than not drinking has largely been debunked or contradicted by the strongest evidence. It seems to not provide a benefit. That doesn't mean that if you want to have a drink once in a while, it's necessarily uh, going to have a big impact on your health, but you don't want to have it be a daily thing if possible, not be a staple of your diet. Uh, yeah, low in ultra processed, low in refined carbohydrates, uh, simple sugars like candy and soda and uh, these uh, sugary cereals, artificial sugary cereal. You want to try to replace that with things like water, tea, coffee, um, whole grains, uh, these other foods that we discussed. That's a, a pretty good primer. And then what about artificial sweeteners? Uh, there's, there's been some evidence, small, I mean, some, some of it was pretty strong evidence, but long-term consumption of Aspartame, uh, saccharin containing sweeteners, even erythritol had some association with either poor cardiovascular outcomes um, or obesity or, or fat gain. Is this something you tell people to avoid or, you know, certainly in diabetics, there's a role for it, right? To avoid sugar. Um, this is a great alternative. So what do you tell people about that? One problem with the research on sweeteners is these these uh, cohort studies, the the observational data, oftentimes sweetener contain sweetener intake will be associated with diseases, with obesity, with cardiovascular disease, with mortality. But demographically, people who consume more sweeteners are often people who are trying to lose weight or people who are struggling with excess body weight. So the challenge there is to separate those two things. So this is what we call reverse causation. The idea based on some other type of, of studies, that this is largely mediated by people who are already overweight, who have these conditions, who have health issues already, and they're trying to improve things by going on the sweeteners. So you'll have this association. The sweeteners will be linked to disease, but they are, at least to some extent, they are an innocent bystander. When these studies are done in a different way, accounting for change, for example, over time, that, that those associations tend to go away, and sometimes they even go in a positive direction. So the balance of evidence is telling us, I think pretty compellingly, that artificially sweetened products are better 
than the sugar sweetened products. So for people who consume, let's say a lot of soda, for example, and they're trying to dial back and they find it too difficult to just stop the soda, they can't go to water or tea or coffee. They're, they miss something about it. Using the artificial, artificially sweetened beverages as training wheels, I think is evidence-based. Uh, most of the evidence points to, be, to it being beneficial for weight loss and for risk of disease. I wouldn't go out of my way as for people who don't consume any of these artificial drinks. I wouldn't tell them to make an effort to introduce artificially sweetened beverages. Um, I think there's a possibility that there are concerns in the long run. The trials that we have are limited in time. The cohort studies are longer, but it's harder to untangle that. So I think it's theoretically possible that they cause issues uh, with the microbiome. There, there's questions about microbiome effects, but it's mainly a question mark. It's mainly a, a black box. We don't know what the effect of eating uh, the, or, or drinking those products for 20 years uh, or 30 years is. Uh, so that would be the, the gist of it. For people who don't consume regular soda, I wouldn't add artificial soda or artificially sweetened drinks either. I don't consume either. But I'm also aware, aware that I'm not the target audience. These products are for people who are consuming regular soda and want uh, something else that doesn't have the sugar. And for those people, the, the evidence is, indicates that, yes, these are better. Yeah, well, if you ever go to a conference with a bunch of physicians, you notice the Diet Coke is what's gone first. Like, <laughs> like all the sugary sweetened drinks are still there. And if you don't get the Diet Soda, then you're out of luck. You got to drink water. <laughs> <laughs> Which just to yep. tell you, that I think even as a community, we tend to, those of us who drink soda occasionally will drink diet sodas rather than drinking full sugar sodas. Yeah. Another quick tidbit is that there's different types of sweeteners. And so the evidence does differ a little bit. And things like stevia, for example, which is a more natural sweetener, tends to come out looking a little bit better when there are concerns in some of these studies. So. I would lean towards that as opposed to the, some of these other more artificial options. If there is a concern in the future that is established, right now the evidence points a little bit, a little bit maybe safer, these uh, the stevia type uh, sweeteners as opposed to spartame and some of these other things. Are you feeling in a rut in the bedroom, wishing you had the kind of sex life you could brag about? I've spent years helping patients and creating content for people all around the world to improve and optimize their sex life. Today, you can get my knowledge for 100% free with my new ebook called Better Sex, Better Life. In this ebook, I review my top 10 tips for improving your sex life, all from the comfort of your own home. All you have to do is go to renamalikmd.com slash more pleasure to download it for free today. So what is something that you think people are missing or they need to know about nutrition that we haven't covered? There's one thing that I've uh, been impressed with lately uh, with some large scale trials looking at salt intake, because this is something that is also a blood pressure, high blood pressure, common problem. Lots of people struggle with it. Major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and excess deaths. And people really struggle to cut back on the salt. And I don't even think that telling people to cut salt or to reduce salt or to eliminate salt is necessarily the most empowering message. Some people are able to do it, but Many people struggle to do it in any meaningful way. So there's a really interesting trial that came out last year. And this is a large-scale trial, 1,600 people over two years. And they basically have two interventions. It was almost like two trials in one. One intervention was they told people to cut salt, to reduce salt gradually over two years. And by the end, there was no difference. Blood pressure didn't come down. Uh, cardiovascular events, heart attacks, strokes didn't come down. And in fact, people were not meaningfully reducing their, their salt intake. They just weren't able to do it in any meaningful way in average. The other intervention, they told them not to eliminate salt, but to try a different type of salt. And what they used was a replacement, a substitution salt. 
And uh, I don't know if your viewers are familiar with potassium salts. I would actually love to get your take on it because it does touch on uh, urological and nephrological aspects as well. But bottom line, this, the potassium salt that was a substitute, uh, by the end of the two years, they saw a reduction in blood pressure, significantly uh, both systolic and diastolic. 34% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, the, the composite uh, outcome of heart attacks, strokes, and cardiovascular uh, reperfusion. And cardiovascular mortality came down by 36%. Just by swapping the type of salt, nothing else. They weren't told to change anything else about their diet or exercise. This is an, an incredible result. And the most impressive thing is they didn't even change all of their salt. 25% of their potassium, of their sodium chloride, which is the run of the mill, their usual salt, 25% of sodium chloride was replaced with potassium chloride, and they still got these results. Now, there's a couple of caveats for people who have certain conditions like chronic kidney disease, for example, or if you're on uh, prescription meds, do talk to your doctor before going on potassium chloride because there's a, a concern about hyperkalemia, about having levels of potassium in the blood that are too high. And this can happen in people whose kidneys are not good at excreting enough potassium. So if you have kidney disease, uh, discuss this with your doctor first. Some medications, some blood pressure lowering meds can interact with the potassium chloride and cause hyperkalemia and uh, blood pressure to go up as well. But in general, I found this to be as hacks go, and people love hacks, and it's difficult to find hacks that are evidence-based. And this has these outcome trials. There's actually now a meta-analysis of trials supporting the benefits of this partial swap. Uh, another thing is the taste. Some people don't like the taste of potassium chloride. Some people think it tastes a bit metallic. It varies. I have a, a salt that's 100% potassium chloride, and I, I don't notice the difference. It just tastes salty to me, but, but some people do uh, differentiate, and they prefer a mix. So 50-50 or 75% normal and 25% potassium chloride, uh, the results are very impressive, even for those minor swaps. So yeah, I'd love to hear if you have any, any, any concerns or any experience with those since it's kind of up your alley. I think it's great. I think if you can swap out for potassium uh, in terms of potassium chloride, I think one, it's fine as long as you don't have any indications, as you mentioned, like kidney disease or other issues with processing potassium. So I think it's, it's very reasonable to do that. Uh, you know, I think the salt thing is also really interesting because I've heard mixed things on this, but if you don't have high blood pressure, is there value in terms of prevention for reducing salt? Yeah. So in this trial, they did have a subgroup analysis. So the, the majority of people in the trial did have higher blood pressure, which is typical in these trials, right? If you're going to look at reduction, you're going to look at people who are have higher blood pressure or risk of cardiovascular disease. But so they tried to address this question of, is this only beneficial if you're already up there? They had a subgroup analysis with people who had lower blood pressure, and the average was like 122 systolic for that group. So pretty decent, uh, close to the threshold that even now the more strict uh, new guidelines that we have are to try to be under 120 for optimal blood pressure. But these guys were in the neighborhood. And even in that group, they did observe an, a benefit of this swap. But there is, with salt, there is individual variability as well. So salt sensitivity is a thing. And some people are just more salt sensitive and they need to be stricter. Other people can have more salt and their blood pressure is still golden. So, you know, it's the 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 unfair nature of genetics is all, always a, a factor. Yeah. Um, well, I'm so, yeah, I don't, I don't... <laughs> I like, yeah, I'm South Asian. We have all the bad genetics. Like, <laughs> you know. Fair. Uh, yeah. So I don't think everybody needs to cut salt, but it's it's something that is pervasive in our society and having these tools where you don't just have to eliminate salt from your diet, but you have these alternatives. You have something that is salty and uh, lowers your blood pressure instead of raising and has outcome data in these large trials uh, behind it is a luxury, I think, and something that should be more uh, well known. Yeah, that's great. That's that's super helpful. So at the end of our podcast, we ask questions about you. So they don't have to be related to nutrition. They can be if you want. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> so. No, <I'm> 
<laughs> so what's something you know now in your life that you wish you knew earlier? Being kinder on myself. I think when I was young, I was I was very gung-ho and very, I had a lot of like paternal energy toward myself. Everything was like, go, go, go. What are you doing? This type of unforgiving energy, right? And I would, I would have a calmer approach to things, uh, understand that perseverance, the value of persevering, the value of trying something over and over and over again, over years, developing mastery, as opposed to trying to be good at something right away and then giving up if not, which is something that I did when I was younger. That I think is a, is a great life lesson that I learned the hard way. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the importance of contribution. The reason I started the YouTube channel was I, I had kind of a midlife crisis, you could call it, but a, a mild one. And instead of buying a Porsche or, or something like that, I, I decided that I wasn't satisfied because I, I felt like I wasn't contributing enough. I was, had a very privileged first half of my life, if I'm lucky, but, um, but I wasn't, it wasn't re rewarding enough in the long run. So I came up with this, let's, let's find a way to convey scientific uh, information to people so that they can make informed choices and improve their health. Right. And yeah, it's been one of the most rewarding things I've done in my entire life. That's amazing. I mean, well, I'm sure everyone, including myself, really appreciates you. But it's so funny. You're like, I, instead of buying a Porsche, I decided to buy a camera and talk at it. And, you know, and like to, to, a, to a room of yeah. emptiness. You know? it was, oh, man. It was so weird in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sitting in an empty room and, and like whipping up the excitement, right? Because the first videos that I shot alone, it was so boring because I'm like, I'm, I'm just, just no, you know, it's hard for me. I, I, I'm used to talking to people face to face and talking into a camera came, came across so stale at first. Uh, but yeah, I think what happens, I, I don't know if that's your experience, but with it, with more, uh, with more experience of, of, uh, making videos, I now visualize the viewers. I'm talking to them directly. Of course, we're not alone in the room. Physically, we are, but in reality, we're not. There's thousands of people behind that camera. So we are communicating to them, even though it doesn't seem in the moment. It's weird for us the way we're, we're wired, but we're absolutely communicating. Uh, so it just became easier with experience to do that, to, to, to be in that reality. That In the beginning, I just couldn't imagine that. Also because in the first videos, I had, you know, 12 people watching. So <laughs> it's harder. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say I actually, even from very early on, looked at my camera like it was my best friend or like it was a good friend or it was, you know, and that's sort of how I've all, I don't look at, I don't visualize a whole bunch of people, but I visualize sort of like I'm talking to one person, you know, I think it all, it all works out. I guess in the end we figured it out, but <laughs> hopefully we're still improving. What's one life hack or health hack besides the potassium chloride that helps improve your life? Gratitude, uh, constantly reminding myself of the positives because I think we tend to focus on what we don't have yet. I think it's kind of a vice and I don't know if it's socially uh, encouraged, but it's something that I, I noticed I had. And when I was young, I was guilty of this more. Always focusing on what I didn't have yet, even when I had a very privileged life. So now I'm much better at stopping myself and going, are you kidding? Look at all these things that you have. Like that should be 90% of the focus. And then sure, try to improve it even more, but be happy with everything that you've conquered and everything that even that was, that was given to you just by virtue of where you were born and you know, lucky to be, to have a great family and all these things and be, be born in a place that is safe and where, you know, we didn't starve or we weren't in the middle of a war. Like all these things are unbelievable privilege that we forget. So that's one, um, finding time for the important things, finding time for my family. Uh, I'm much better at that now. I spent almost 20 years living across the world for my family. I'd see them once a year and now I'm close and I, I spent time daily uh, with, with, with them. Uh, exercise, finding time for exercise is huge because it's so easy to, to tell ourselves, oh, I'm so busy, I'll go next week. But that is one thing that I am proud of is I, I do push myself and I'm not one of these lucky people that 
exercise is just natural for them. They wake up at 5 a.m. and they go for run a marathon. I, I'm not one of those those guys. Yeah. Uh, no, I my brain does not want to do it. My brain pushes to the end of the day and go, and keeps trying to trick me, like do it tomorrow. Like you work out, worked out yesterday, and you already walk. So every day I have to overcome that uh, the little devil on my shoulder. But virtually every day I I do put on my shoes and go. Atomic habits. I just do it one at a time. Just okay. Just put on your shoes. Okay. Just um, just grab your towel. Just grab the the keys, and before you know it, you're walking to the gym. I like that. I like that. I I continuously work on self improvement, on getting better at, at things that I do, and am now kinder on myself than I used to be. That's that's really great. Is there a non negotiable like something you have to do every day? Probably, uh, if my family needs something from me everything else disappears to the, in the, into the background. Yeah. Um, if my mom needs something with her health situation, nothing else exists. My health doesn't exist. Professional duties all disappears. Uh, that would be the only thing that would completely obliterate everything else. But uh, for, for, for things that I do for, for myself, yeah, that I could, I could take a day off a uh, gym or, um, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm also not obsessive with my diet. Sometimes people think or or ask, "Is your diet perfect? Like, do you ever eat?" People feel really bad. I ate some candy or I ate this. I am not a monk. Like, I'll eat a, a cookie if I feel like it. Mm -hmm. I'll eat something. That's not, you know, uh, I have no problems. Yeah, I'll, it's just not a staple of my diet, and I, I just don't won't eat the, the whole sleeve of cookies every day. But yeah, I, I'm not worried about the the two percent. Uh, the little corner of the painting, as long as most of it is in, in place. Yeah. So last question is, if tomorrow you woke up, you lost all your training, you are no longer able to do research, no longer able to be a clinician, what would you do with your life? These questions are a lot harder than the research questions. Can we go back to, <laughs> we go back to the trials and the data? And the <laughs> I think you would love it. I love it when people ask about me because I think people always ask about our work, which is great. I love that too. But it's like, okay, yeah, I'm a person too. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm joking. No, I, I'm glad to to go there. I think I'd be maybe maybe a a public speaker, maybe a coach, a life coach. Uh, if I couldn't talk about research or science, I would still try to give people uh, tools to improve their lives in other ways. Maybe as a maybe as a coach, a life coach. I actually dabbled in that in a previous life. And I loved it. And kind of what I do with the, the the content is a bit of a marriage of that previous career in life coaching with the career in, in science and the background in science. So kind of a happy marriage of those things. Um, so maybe, maybe I do, I would do that. Very cool. So Gil, where can people find you online? Uh, the main uh, hub is the YouTube channel, Nutrition Made Simple. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, at nutrition made s3 is the handle and then we have a pa facebook page also sometimes pre people prefer that where we post most of the videos and links if you search nutrition made simple you should be able to find it my last name works too but it's kind of a wi-fi password with all the latin <laughs> words uh, the letters in there people sometimes can't spell it but nutrition made simple on google you'll find most of our content all right well thank you so much for your time we really appreciate it Thank you for having me. Had a great time. Thank you guys so much for joining us on today's episode of the podcast. If you're liking the podcast, please make sure to subscribe and follow us on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating or review. This goes a long way and it's a zero cost way to support us and help reach more people each and every week. And as always, remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.